recording. And I will share a slide here and Tony will start. <laughs> Getting things arranged. Okay. Okay, Tony, I'll take it away. Oops. Uh, thank, thanks, mate. Yeah, this one. Uh, so, no, let's talk about uh, ocean on modeling with uh, Rocky 3D. Uh, and first, I'd like to uh, walk you through uh, the different configurations of uh, Ocean you can use with a uh, Rocky 3D. And that will mostly depend on what kind of research you're focusing on or what kind of a uh, planet you're trying to model. Uh, the first config configuration is called the, 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 the prescribed SST or sea surface temperature where well, basically you're going to, to run a uh, standalone dynamic atmosphere coupled uh, with a file containing uh, prescribed sea surface temperatures. Uh, usually that's a, a NetCDF file. And that, that, that's the only information that uh, your uh, atmosphere module uh, will, will get from the, from the ocean. And then that, 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 for example, that, that's useful when you're trying to do modern Earth, uh, since we, we have access to uh, uh, sea surface temperature uh, through satellites or drifters, uh, uh, observational data. Also has the, the, the great advantage uh, to be uh, much more uh, computationally cheap than a, a fully coupled atmosphere uh, ocean run. Uh, you could conceivably also use it as a way well, if you want to do a set of sensitivity, sensitivity experiments when you want to see how your atmosphere will uh, respond to different uh, sea surface temperature. Uh, the second configuration is what we call uh, a Q-flux run, where uh, instead of coupling your atmosphere with a prescribed sea surface temperature, now you're going to couple it with a, a slab uh, ocean. And at each time step, you're going to compute uh, the heat flux uh, Q, hence Q flux run. Uh, Q is the, the, the heat flux between the, the atmosphere uh, and the ocean. And that, that's going to give you uh, a more uh, realistic picture of your dynamic uh, climate system while still being cheaper than a, a fully uh, coupled uh, uh, model. Uh, which is our, our third option, uh, where you now you have a, a fully dynamic ocean coupled to your atmosphere. It's going to be the most physically realistic uh, uh, configuration, but obviously the, 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 the most expensive one CPU-wise, CPU because in addition to your at dynamic atmosphere, now you're going to, uh, to, to calculate your uh, for example, the, the, the momentum equation for the ocean, the, the vertical mixing, the mesoscale, mi the, 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 the horizontal mixing through uh, mesoscale EDs, uh, the ocean tide. Uh, so that, yeah, the, the, that's going to be uh, expensive, um, the, the, the most expensive one. Uh, the fourth and final configuration uh, is the, the, what we call the standard on ocean. Uh, it's at the opposite spectrum, uh, at the opposite of the spectrum from uh, the first, the first configuration. We had a, a dynamic atmosphere with a, a prescribed uh, ocean. This one is a dynamic ocean with a prescribed atmosphere, where uh, you, you're going to uh, specify a set of files describing the, the atmosphere at the top of the ocean. Uh, so, you, for example, you're going to have a, a file uh, describing the, the wind speed. Uh, at the top of the ocean. Uh, another file would describe the, the temperature of the atmosphere at the surface. Another one would be the, the incoming radiation. And then you have the, the precipitation. Uh, so that, that that's interesting also because it's uh, cheaper than a fully coupled model where when you have access to uh, 
surface condition or in some, in some cases when you are going to to model a subsurface ocean where you don't have to do to, to model uh, uh, a surface uh, atmosphere uh, for, for example in cases like um, Europa or Enceladus in our solar system where we know that there, there's a an ocean of uh, liquid water uh, under a thick ice shell uh, next night again uh, no, go, go going back to uh, some of the, the Rundex that uh, Costas uh, described before the break, you can, you can for example, compare uh, the, the, this one MP1 SOM40, which is for uh, a dynamic ocean run for, for, for a fully coupled uh, ocean, uh, atmosphere ocean run. And you can, you can compare it with a, a P4SQ M40, which is a Q-flux run. Uh, some of the key differences, you're going to see uh, some of the source files uh, at the beginning uh, of the run deck uh, are present in, the, the, in, the, in your uh, P1 uh, SOM40 run deck, and uh, they, they won't be there in your Qflux run. Uh, and and, and the, the, these different subroutines are in charge of the, 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 the whole ocean dynamics from the uh, the, the mixing to the tides. Uh, a second difference, if you scroll down uh, to the parameter section, you're going to find uh, things like uh, this parameter Kyoshan equal one, which is going to indicate to your model that you want you want to read you want to run with a, a dynamic uh, ocean. Uh, Mike, you can go to the next one. Uh, if you scroll even further down uh, i want you to look at these uh, three input files that are uh, related to the the ocean yep. uh, uh, the first one is a uh, oic that uh, costa has described before that's the, the initial condition for your uh, uh, ocean we're going to specify the values for <laughs> the temperature and salinity uh, so temperature uh, it is described in uh, Celsius. Salinity will be described in a. Uh, uh, it's 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 described in a model. But it's in thousands of a uh, PSU. Uh, in a, in a, in Planet Two, you will have a uh, uh, more option to create your uh, OIC files. Uh, topo underscore OIC describe your uh, ocean topography and bathymetry. So you one variable will be the land ocean mass. There, there are no uh, partial uh, land ocean cells. So it's, it's either equal to zero if it's land or one uh, if it's uh, the ocean. Another variable, we describe the, the depth of your ocean cells. And uh, a third one, we describe the, the height of your <laughs> land cells. Uh, another uh, interesting uh, Input file you want you 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 might want to use is uh, the the one called Ostraits. It's basically a, a text list of all the straits uh, that are uh, separating to to uh, uh, ocean mass in in your uh, in your in your uh, ocean topography. Uh, basically, you're going to specify the the name of the strait, uh, the the uh, entrance and the exit point of your straits. Uh, the the, the the width of the strait and the, the, the depth uh, of the of the strait. Uh, and finally, a few yeah, the, the, I just listed a, a few updates uh, when we release Planet Two. Uh, one you might want to use when uh, when you are trying to run deep oceans, and by deep oceans I mean tens to hundreds of kilometers. Uh, the current version of our ocean model is a, hy a hydrostatic model. Uh, but that doesn't apply when you're uh, some of the simplification that we had to do to, to get a hydrostatic model don't apply to uh, uh, these depths. So, so yeah, 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 you have to slightly modify the physics to, to get a, a full treatment of the Coriolis force, uh, as well as the relaxation of the, the shadow water uh, approximation. Uh, something I think you can use just about hitting plant one. Yeah, it, it's been uh, reported to, uh, to, to plant one. But, but basically, you can specify either a constant geothermal heating at the bottom of the ocean or create a net CDF file that will 
uh, describe uh, what kind of uh, heating you have uh, uh, at the bottom. Uh, you will have more option for uh, mesoscale uh, to specify the, the mesoscale diffusivity with some uh, fancy uh, uh, exponential, exponentially decreasing uh, uh, mesoscale diffusivity. Uh, you'll be able to use things like uh, the, the bottom drag or the coastal drag for, for the ocean. Uh, some improved sea ice uh, thermodynamics and dynamics uh, as well as uh, some, something that can be also interesting for small planetary bodies with, uh, with uh, deep oceans where the gravity, for, for example, on Enceladus has a radius of around 200 to 300 kilometers, a third of that is, uh, is uh, water. Uh, and so you, you, you might conceive that the, the gravity at the top of the ocean might actually be different uh, from uh, the, the gravity at the bottom of the ocean. All on Earth, we can basically consider the gravity constant uh, over the whole uh, ocean depth. And uh, I think that's it. That's it, yeah. So we're going to switch over to <laughs> Igor, who's going to talk about uh, changing topography. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah. Tony already actually described, I guess, some of these files for for ocean. But yeah, basically, um, there are quite a few input files in the in the model. So, uh, Topa is the file where you actually change the topography, uh, and uh, pretty much, uh, yes, you have to. Specify uh, the, uh, the, uh, the elevation of the of the model, and then you have to specify the fractions of uh, different types uh, of uh, of surfaces. So there is a variable I guess called Z topa, which you specify set to elevation uh, over the sea level in meters. And then you specify fractions of uh, of ocean, fraction of uh, of lakes, uh, fraction of uh, land ice, permanent land ice, uh, and I think those are the main thing. You said in the profile, actually, I was just about to show it uh, in uh, in Panoply, but I didn't didn't have time to. Maybe I'll show it during the discussion. I don't want to stop right now. So, uh, Topo OC, OC it's, a, uh, it's a similar file. Uh, as far as I remember, it, you, you have to specify the um, bathymetry of your of your ocean, also in meters. You, you specify a fraction of uh, ocean. Some data actually is uh, duplicated in Topo, in Topo OC file, as far as I remember. Uh, so it has, uh, if you do it, it has to be compatible. Uh, one important thing to know that uh, I don't remember if Tony mentioned or not that our ocean cannot have partial cells. So all uh, cells should be uh, when specifying ocean, you have to specify that also cells should be either completely ocean or completely land. Uh, uh, in all our examples, uh, as far as I remember, ocean and uh, atmosphere, uh, atmospheric part have the same uh, grid, but that doesn't have to be uh, the same. You can have a finer resolution uh, grid for, for the ocean. And if you do this, then uh, your ocean still have to be specified on whole grids, so it's either ocean grid or uh, or a land grid, but uh, in top of file, you can have partial grids if, uh, if your, your atmosphere is specified on coarser topography, uh, on coarser grid, uh, that uh, our atmospheric part can handle uh, partial uh, grid cells. So then RVAR file, it's river directions uh, file. It's, it's a little weird, it's difficult to look at. Uh, Basically, what it specifies, it specifies uh, where rivers should uh, flow from each cell. So for each cell, you specify basically a downstream direction, and you specify it in terms of, uh, I think in point one, it's still in, in, in terms of uh, grid cell numbers. 
So basically, like you have uh, some grids, I would say 40, 40, and uh, then to specify that the uh, flow of the river goes to like uh, neighboring cell, you should specify that uh, that grid is a number like 40, 41. So that's down, down grid cell. Uh, it's maybe a little difficult to set up, but uh, if you write a proper script, uh, it's uh, not terribly difficult. And also recently we made an upgrade to the model that there is a parameter which allows you basically to skip modifying this uh, file completely and let the model to decide uh, river directions based on topography. So, so that, that's the easy way, but uh, one should understand that it, it may not always work well, especially like if you really know what's going on with your planet like Earth, uh, you may know that the uh, Rivers sometimes cut uh, the, their way through, uh, through higher elevation uh, regions. So sometimes you want to specify river directions, even the, though they be like, uh, they, they may be, uh, they may not coincide with what you get uh, from topography maps. So uh, you may need to specify those. The name river is actually applicable only to Earth. Uh, uh, on Earth, we want uh, to see diagnostics for particular rivers. So we basically specify the river mouse for each river, and then model checks uh, how much runoff goes through that uh, the, to that cell. Uh, and you get you get a nice printout uh, in the printout file, like with all uh, uh, river runoffs uh, over over a particular period, either. A month or a year, so it's useful for Earth, but probably less useful for other planets. Uh, then uh, we mentioned here variable lake uh, variable. It's nearly always should be uh, should be one uh, in all uh, in all runs. So basically, if you set it to zero, that means that uh, your your lakes are fixed. Uh, that means that. Uh, uh, lakes uh, fractions which you specified in your topo file will be preserved through your through your run. That sometimes may cause problems because your lakes may like, accumulate a lot of water uh, or may dry out, uh, and you want actually them to shrink and expand. So if you set that variable lake equal to one, then that will allow lakes to shrink, expand, uh, completely disappear if needed, and pretty much it works very well. Uh, uh, one important thing here is uh, that uh, you should know that uh, when you start uh, the model, basically your lakes are re reinitialized to, uh, to uh, uh, fractions that specified in your topo file. So sometimes when you start a new run from the restart file, which you say from previous run, you have to make sure uh, that uh, you set uh, all your variables in such a way that you don't uh, accidentally, accidentally uh, reinitialize your lakes if uh, the, your run, run was spun up in certain conditions. Uh, I guess I don't have time to dis discuss it right here, but maybe we can discuss it in uh, in QA, or maybe there will be uh, some discussion tomorrow. And I think this only matters for I start because eight. Yes. Uh, if, if we further discuss our I start yeah. equal eight, we can discuss it in more detail. Yeah. I start equal to nine will uh, ignore all those uh, settings that will just continue your run as it is. So you, you shouldn't be worried about resetting uh, anything. But ju just just keep in mind that basically you start from from the conditions specified in top of file, and those conditions may change significantly for lakes because sometimes lakes may expand up to 90% of cells where there was no lake at all. So keep that in mind. Uh, yeah, OIC is uh, ocean initial conditions files. And, uh, uh, I don't think we have time to discuss this. Uh, it's kind of uh, complicated. So probably should look at this file and uh, figure out what it is there and maybe ask us, or maybe we can discuss it during QA and Q&A, but pretty much OIC file, it's ocean initial conditions files. 
it should be compatible with uh, proper OC uh, conditions. Yes, and if you modify it, you have to modify OAC file. Maybe the easiest way sometimes when you uh, modify initial conditions files is to, if you create new cells uh, which didn't exist in previous, uh, uh, in previous configuration, just to copy cells from, uh, from uh, like existing uh, copy copy data from existing cells basically duplicating it but it may not work that well for ocean because you have to specify also fluxes uh, so you should be careful uh, in extending ocean uh, yeah so then gel <clears throat> melt uh, uh, Yeah, I think gel melt is where you put uh, your melt data. Yes. Ah, so yeah, uh, one hack I would say that we implement in our model. I, I think it was was not discussed before. Uh, uh, sometimes we uh, we don't have a dynamic uh, uh, ice sheets yet. Uh, so basically. You either specify a fixed ice sheet that uh, basically is permanent ice in certain area, and uh, you may also have just uh, normal seasonal snow which accumulates uh, during the winter and then melts during the summer. Uh, but uh, sometimes you just accumulate uh, too too much snow, like on either on of seasonal snow uh, which doesn't melt during the summer or uh on ice sheets and uh if we had a dynamic ice sheet that would mean that you just form new areas of permanent ice uh, which can exp expand and uh, basically should move uh, downhills but we don't have this uh model yet uh, so we have to somehow remove uh, extra uh ice or snow which accumulates in such areas so we basically have a hack uh, that you can set a parameter to say that if you accommodate uh, more than certain amount of uh, uh, of uh, ice per, per per cell, remove all that ice to, to the ocean. And this ice uh, is, it is it is assumed that this ice is removed by the ice flows uh, from uh, from ice sheets to the to the areas uh, of the ocean near the ice sheets. So this gel melt uh, array, uh, just gel melt uh, input file basically specifies uh, the areas uh, of the ocean where you want this uh, ice to be removed. So by default, it is uh, for Earth, it is uh, defined like near Antarctica and near Greenland, but you can change it to whatever you want in your runs. And sometimes you may want just to dump it somewhere in the middle of the ocean just to get rid of the extra ice just because you want uh, your model to get running no matter what and usually it doesn't have that much in impact but you have to keep in mind that yes you add uh cold uh, cold water basic frozen water so a lot of heat will change the temperature of the uh, ocean where you put this uh, ice and also will change salinity yeah, and PSN max, that's basically the maximum uh, snow depth that you can set uh, so that everything above this amount is being moved, moved to the to the ocean. I think it's, if you set it to zero, it'll accumulate. Yeah, and if you set it to zero, then uh, this algorithm is disabled and you will accumulate everything that. Uh, and it's uh, the same also for the lake ice where, where we have the maximum. Of five meters and then whatever is about five meters is done. Yeah, is it different uh, parameter? Or yep, is it, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, you check. Uh, uh, yeah, and uh, just I wanted to say that uh, for for planet without ocean like Mars, you definitely have to set this uh, parameter to zero because there is no ocean where you can dump uh, extra water. So it will be just being accumulated uh, pretty much in the memory. So you will be uh, you will not conserve water. Well, I mean, it will be conserved, but in in a way which is not used, uh, so it's not a proper thing to do for for uh, for planets without ocean. 
So you, uh, you always, always have to set it to zero. I guess it's about it to the plug. Okay. So, uh, yeah, that's another topic. Uh, basically, if you create a new planet, uh, we probably will discuss it tomorrow, like how to create a new planet in more detail. So this is just briefly what you have to do. Uh, so if if you're running uh, Earth, uh, then you basically don't need to change anything uh, by default. Uh, it's just an Earth uh, planet. But uh, yeah, you have to set up uh, basically the switch with the model from Earth uh, to non Earth uh, conditions. Uh, you, you will see it as an example in, uh, in the Randex. Uh, there, will, there will be a line, a line at the beginning of the Randex in uh, preprocessing constructions where you give a planet a, a new name. And this, uh, this, uh, Instruction automatically basically switches uh, the the model from Earth model to planetary model. So then you have to specify all these uh, parameters which are mentioned here. And if you don't specify some of them, uh, they will be just taken. Uh, you will be using Earth value. So if you want to, so you have to specify a planet name. It's mostly for your record keeping. So you will see which planet you are using. Uh, then for orbit, you will specify. Eccentricity, uh, dimensionless, uh, obliquity in degrees. Uh, 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 then uh, you will need to specify a calendar. Uh, calendar basically, uh, it doesn't really, well, yeah, uh, it's, no, it's uh, maybe it's, it's a little confusing this on this slide. So, yeah. It's not actually calendar, it's still orbital parameters. Uh, so you have to specify uh, sidereal, sidereal ob 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 orbital period. So it's a rotation around the star. Sidereal uh, rotation period, that's a rotation around its own axis. Uh, and uh, quantize uh, year length, it's a, it's a Boolean parameter, uh, true or false. And uh, normally, just to, for your convenience, you want usually the number of days, uh, you want that you, your year to have integral number of days. So quantize year length equal to true, or yes, uh, that would mean that the, basically your, I think it's a rotational period will be slightly adjusted uh, so that uh, you will have integer number of days per year. And that is uh, much more convenient for outputting diagnostics rather than, than when you have basically sort of like moving new year and uh, it's difficult to keep trace of things. Uh, okay. Yeah, and, but, it, but, it, but it does set the calendar of these things because the yeah. orbital period sets the calendar that you're using. That's that's the fault. But Tom will talk about that in detail. Yeah, yeah. Tom will uh, Tom Polony will talk uh, about this more in more detail tomorrow because you can use different calendars from or basically the same uh, model. Uh, like for example, for Moon, I'm using Earth calendar because it's more convenient. Though if I would define it by a rotational period of the Moon, it would, it would be completely different. It would be like 14 years, 14. Earth days uh, day, but uh, instead I'm using Earth days. So there, are, there are ways to change the calendar uh, in such a way that it's uh, more convenient for the problem you're solving. Uh, but yeah, by default, uh, it pretty much will be defined by these uh, parameters. I don't want to go into details because Tom will describe it uh, tomorrow. Uh, Your greenhouse uh, gases you specify in GIG file, you will see, uh, I don't remember how about five uh, gases there, but uh, the most six. Things, oh, six? After six. Okay, six. but you have all CO2, the, uh, N2O, methane, and all, uh, two CFCs, four CFCs, three CFCs. Three, three. There must be three. Yeah, anyway. but mo most of those. Six yeah, but most of those are interesting only for Earth simulations. Uh, uh, for planetary simulations, mostly we are using just uh, for setting CO2 
So basically, CO two, I think, is the first uh, one uh, in that. CO two, methane. Yeah, well, maybe methane is also uh, kind of important. So there are comments there which uh, tell uh, which column correspond to which uh, uh, to which gas. It's it's an ASCII file, and it has uh, basically the first column is a, a year because it's earth oriented. So the first column is year for which you specify it, and then uh, the values for different greenhouse gases in uh, parts per per million, uh, and for Planetary uh, runs usually you have to specify just one line uh, uh, to basically uh, have, have, have it constant because usually we don't change uh, those, those, those gases for planetary uh, simulations. We just want to specify the amount of uh, certain gases. For example, uh, to specify the amount of CO2, that's the only way to do it. So you specify it there. Uh, it is done, uh, this approach is uh, sort of a little hackish because uh, again, that's how it's used for, for Earth simulations. So you specify either the, the exact uh, amount in this GHG file, or you can use multipliers uh, in the run deck. So you can set, set for example, uh, uh, the amount in GHD to one, and then set multiplier in the run deck, uh, to the actual amount of the gas, it's uh, it's your preference depending on uh, what what you want. So if you change switch from planet to planet, do you want to use different GHD files or you want to uh, do everything in the run deck? Uh, depending uh, on on your preferences, you can do either. But pretty much, yes. Uh, so next bullet describes this. Uh, so there are multipliers which you can set in your Run dex uh, CH, CH4X, uh, CH, CH2X, and to OX. And that basically means that the amount specified in GHG file will be just multiplied by this multiplier. And that's how you set these uh, gases. Other gases are set in, in one of the source files. Uh, hopefully, somebody will go over it uh, tomorrow. So I will not. Uh, Right now, I think uh, Chris will go on. The yeah, plan Chris plan plan will uh, explain in all details uh, yeah. how this specific line. Yeah. yeah, that's uh, the next component. That's what it's saying. Okay. Should I go forward? Uh, planet has, oh, yeah, I guess uh, the last bullet is important. It's uh, uh, setting uh, your ins installation again uh, uh, by default it's uh, it's uh, earth installation in solar system but you can change uh, this parameter planet as zero to any value you want to or up to reason uh, to up to reasonable amount and that's uh, that's basically your solar constant or stellar constant uh, so that's how much your how much radiation per meter square your Planet is getting uh, from from the star. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm just gonna skip over that slide and then go to the crash. Yeah. Well, and uh, as you probably understood, the model is not perfect, uh, and uh, it was written for Earth and then modified uh, modified modified for. Uh, uh, like arbitrary planets, so there are a lot of cases when it will not work or will not work very well. So uh, often it will crash, and we try to collect most uh, usual uh, situa situations in when if they crash, uh, when the model may crash in this document uh, which is referred here. But uh, if you don't find an answer here, feel free to ask us. Uh, so most usual crashes uh, will happen uh, or could be fixed uh, with changing time step, usually changing to smaller time step. Or there is one parameter which specifies how often radiation is called just to spare time. Usually we don't call radiation on every time step. Uh, it's usually uh, each fifth time that it's being called. So you can start to call it more often and that usually makes your model more stable. Uh, 
there is also some conditions where basically you cannot run the model like if our ocean freezes to the bottom then the model will stop and there is nothing you can do so well there are also I mean, ways to deal with it like to make your ocean deeper uh, so so some of this uh, methods are specified in this uh, file so i guess you also don't have time to go through all of them you will see if your model crashes so you will kind of figure out what's in that uh, file and yes and feel free to ask us if uh, you don't find this information and your model crashes so uh, so i guess uh, i think we switch over to costas now cool. yeah Okay, so you have the, um, the model running and you are generating output. So let's discuss about the output, uh, what exactly is it and uh, how you can see it. The, the first thing when, that you can actually even see as the model is running is the PRP file. It is saved in the output directory. It is called, it has the file name. The file name is the runid.prp. And it contains everything that you have in the model saying essentially print star comma whatever. And uh, it's, I mean, the syntax is a little bit different for parallel computing, but it's uh, the idea is the same. Everything that Fortran, the Fortran code dumps as default output goes there. Uh, and it tells you things like diagnostic output, how initialization output. Um, it tells you what, what's the, the current date so you know how far the model has progressed. And then at the end, it tells you that, you know, when it's finished. And it also contains frequently some useful output uh, in terms of model crashes. So very frequently, especially if the model crashes at the very beginning, the, the error you will see at the, on your terminal will be very generic and not helpful. Always, always look at the PRT file. If the model crashes, because it is probably where it's uh, the the error. It might be elsewhere, but my point is, do not rely on what the terminal says. It is probably not useful in many cases. Then the standard model output we get is um, the one in the second bullet, which is the it contains the three letters of the month name, so Jan, Feb, Mar, etc. And uh, we have 12 months regardless of the planet. We just change the duration of those. And then a four digit year, which can be more than four if you set it up, if you set it properly, if you want to run for more than 10,000 years, orbits to be correct. And uh, then there is um, an abbreviation, a, a three or, or, I mean, I have three Zs there. Uh, frequently it is three letters, but it might be more or less. That ex essentially explains which type of file it is. The standard file there is ACC, which means stands for accumulation. And I'll get to that in a minute. And then it's the runid.nc. So it's always an SDF file. So I will discuss about the accumulation files later, uh, but uh, just to give you the first idea, this accumulation file is not the one you will be using with your scripts to create plots, for example. Uh, this is a bulk file that contains a lot of stuff, and we have a processor, a, a post processor that is dealing with that. I'll come to that in a minute. Then another type of files that is saved is the RSF files. They are the restart files that you can use to continue a model simulation or repeat a part of the simulation or anything you want. Um, they, they can be saved as frequently as every month or as infrequently as you like. There is a flag in the model, in the run deck that says called KRSF and it says how every how many months to save the file. So it's a very big file. So think twice before you start saying I want it every month because it will, it's the, it's the one that will fill up all your disk space. Uh, so in general, you decide whether you want that frequently or not, depending on how long a month takes to simulate or a year or a decade. 
and then also how big this file is. Typically, we I would say that once every decade is enough for the medium resolution file, uh, for the medium resolution of model, but uh, you can decide on that. Then there are the two files, they are called fort.1.nc and fort.2.nc. And uh, these two files are checkpoint files that are saved every n disk time steps. And the end disk is the numbers defined in the run deck. I think the default we have is 960. It's uh, but you can actually change it to whatever you want. 720. 720. Although we've moved to 14 forward. Okay. So it's it's something like in the order of around a thousand. And uh, it's different, I guess, in giving the run decks. Uh, yeah, it, we might not be it's... consistent with that. Yeah. So the this is the file where the model will continue if you stop the model gracefully or not. And um, there are two files that it saves once one, once the other, only because if the model crashes during the writing of this file, then you, your whole simulation is not gone forever, but you have the previous one to continue from that. So um, the model is smart enough to go and pick the most recent one to continue from there. If it happens to be corrupt, then you can simply delete it or override one, the, the good one with the old one or make a soft link. Um, but this is I, essentially the same structure as the RSF file. Um, you, you don't want to write them too often either because uh, uh, input output, uh, when you're writing files too frequently, that can impact the, the yeah. performance of the, yeah, exactly. the system. Exactly. These are, these are really big files and it saves them in double precision also. So it's, they're really big. The, unless you feel that your model is really unstable and you're debugging, having an infrequent writing in those files is, is okay. And that's set yeah. by this end disk, as we say that. Yes. Yeah, the, the main difference between LSF file and fourth one for two files uh, right now is that uh, LSF file don't don't save diagnostics because diagnostics are uh, reset at, at the beginning of every month. <clears throat> so our save files are smaller because they don't have those uh, correlators. Otherwise, they pretty much could be treated uh, identically for, for one or two files and other set files. But but, the, so, but you might want to use RS the, write out the RSF files because you might want to restart your run from an earlier epoch, for example. So let's say your run goes 5,000 years, but you realize that 1,000 years you want to spawn off a different run. Yeah. That's why you, you typically would use these RSFs. Exactly. Because yeah. as Igor says, otherwise you can just use the fort files to keep your run going. Yeah, and the RSF files survive as, they, as the model continues. The uh, fort that one and two files are being overridden every other end yes. this step. Yeah, but basically the rule should be... Uh, don't use for one for two files to start new runs and then, unless you know what you're doing. Yeah, RSF, RSF files are for that because uh, you have to really will need to do some tricks with time stepping and starting time because starting time should uh, correspond to the time specified in RSF file. So that's uh, somebody yeah. probably will go through that tomorrow. Yeah, I think that we don't have to discuss the this, this yeah. detail just think that port one and two are the standard restart files that the model is doing when you stop it or when it crashes rsf files are the restart files that you will be using if you want to start with high start line for example and uh, so if you set k rsf to zero then it will not save the rsf file at all uh, then we have the ACC files that I said in bullet number two. Uh, if they, you control whether you want them or not with the K copy uh, file uh, line in the run deck, zero does not save them, one does. I can't think of a scenario why one does not want the main model output, but it's there in case, uh, for example, you run a very long spin up that you don't care about it at all, and then you want output after like 5,000 years. Um, but the ACC, the ACC files are the core of the output you will be looking at. So you really want those. Uh, so 
as I said, these are accumulation files and you convert them into real files that you can actually use by the tool that is the, the utility that is called scale ACC. And if you had followed our instructions before the tutorial, you already have that working on your environment. It is in the MK underscore Diax directory. And um, you can use it to convert uh, those files. So you can generate, for example, an AIJ file, which means atmosphere and then IJ dimensions, so longitude latitude. So this AIJ file contains fields two-dimensional fields in longitude and latitude related with the atmosphere. If you want to create means of months, including annual means, seasonal means, multi-year means, whatever, you do not do it in the generated AIJ files, but you do it in the ACC files. So you have this other utility that you also have compiled called some files. You take all the ACC files you want, and you combine them using some files to create a combined ACC file, and then you scale that file. Um, so it's it's a very easy way to create means of any temporal resolution you care about in the from the model output. And the mod and the some files script knows is smart enough to be able to figure out how to name the resulting output based on what you are providing as input. Uh, then another utility that uh, exists in MKDIAX is called diff report. This is extremely useful if you want to compare NetCDF files in terms of data only and not metadata. So if you have, for example, two simulations that you have run and you want them to be exactly the same uh, and because for whatever reason you want to test that, then you can use diff report in the output and uh, you will see that compares the data between two NetCDF files and it will tell you which variables differ and which are not. It's not easy to use the, the command diff of Linux because diff will just blindly check the binary files and will tell you, hey, this differ because you know one character in a metadata uh, field is different. Diff report actually checks the data and ignores the metadata completely. And it's uh, very useful for any NetCDF file, to be honest, not regardless of Rocky 3D. Uh, I have used that for totally different files. Uh, and then to actually seeing the output and making plots, there are you can use whatever you want, the language of your choice, you know, Python, C, whatever you want. Even uh, I know people making plots with Fortran. And uh, so, but if you want to see it very, very quickly, uh, there is the ncview command, which is something very generic you can find on, on Linux. It creates pretty ugly plots, but very informative. It's, uh, I use it very frequently for quick plotting. But if you want some nice plots, you can use uh, Panoply, which is something that we develop here at YES. And uh, we can, you can use it. It is an extremely smart tool to create uh, geo data. It has over a hundred different projections that you can use probably, who knows how many color bars. And it has really many options. And uh, you know, it has an accessible developer. We find the bug, we want a new feature, we email him and then some newer version, we probably have it. It's a really powerful tool that I invite you to actually try, try it out because it is really, really useful. And it even has a way to create scripts if you want to go into more advanced usage. You can create a custom plot and then save the configuration and then apply that configuration to future plots. It's really, really powerful. Um, I think else we should take a break and then we'll just cover the last uh, two slides. Okay, so take a break. 10 minutes, 10 minutes? Yep, 15 or 10 minutes, I guess. Okay, 10 minutes at the top of the hour, we meet again. Yeah. Okay, y'all. We'll see you in a few minutes. Okay. Up again, we're just going to cover, we're going to start up again and just cover a couple last slides. So let me go over here and start the slideshow. And then I will share the slideshow in the other window. Okay. Just share the best time.
And I will let Costas finish up with these last two slides before we go into the Q&A. Okay, so in the tutorial, in, in the pre-tutorial material that you have received, uh, there are instructions on how to use a scale ACC. So essentially you say scale ACC, ACC file, and then a list of files that you want to generate in the output. If you say all, you get everything. Nobody needs all, uh, but uh, the most common ones are listed below here. And uh, I'm not going to go into the details. You can read those and you have the slides also so you can access those links that we have. But in general, you need to remember that A in the file it means atmosphere, O means ocean, and then I and J means the longitude and latitude. L means the vertical dimension in model levels. And K means the vertical dimension in constant pressure level. Uh, I think that the K has been eliminated in Planet 2.0. And oh, we, so no, yeah. that's still around. It's in E3, I think. It's yeah. Is it? I, I get the feeling that the uh, AIJ, uh, I mean, IJL and IJK files now have mixture of yeah. diagnostics. So you, you actually have to look both at both uh, because they both have uh, uh, model level and uh, constant yeah. pressure diagnostics. Yeah, so I know so. for a fact that the, there are constant pressure diagnostics in a in IJL files. I thought that the K yeah, was but, completely eliminated. Yeah. Probably that's the idea for, yeah, but that's maybe, for a different yeah. discussion. That's yeah. a different discussion. So well, anyway, that's the important thing. A, atmosphere, O, ocean, IJL or IJK or JL or whatever tells you the dimensionality of all those files. And in case you're using tracers just for history, there is also a T that goes up Next ahead time. of that. Oh, is it? Yeah. So. Yeah. Oh yeah, so yeah. these are the other things. Um, <laughs> there are many, I mean, uh, T, O, I, J, L, tracers in the ocean, three-dimensional, uh, et cetera. T conserve, conservation diagnostics for tracers, et cetera. So that's the idea. Most of the file, the people, most of us are using AIJ. And if you want to see something about the vertical structure of the atmosphere, AIJL. If you are using the ocean, you use OIJ and OIJL. And I think that for that covers 95% of all your users you will ever be using, you ever be doing. Um, I don't think I have something else. Yeah, I would just I would just mention. One thing is that I think one of the great strengths of this model is its diagnostic output. Uh, we output a lot of diagnostics. It's also one of the problems with the model. There's a tremendous variety of diagnostics, mostly because as people use the model and develop the model, they add diagnostics that they need for a science project. So diagnostics are often added, but they are seldom removed. For example, maybe they're not needed. Um, so that's the plus and the minus. So if there's something you want, we probably generate it. The other thing to be careful about with the diagnostics is that units are not consistent with diagnostics. In some diagnostics, you might find humidity specif specific humidity specified in grams per kilogram. Other times you might find specified in grams per gram or kilograms per kilogram. So be careful, look at the diagnostic carefully and the units that are specified um, and make sure that you understand the units. And also specified. speaking of units, in many cases, we have also some pre some multiplication factors yes. in that uh, you must also take into account. So if you see somewhere saying 10 to the minus two kilograms per kilogram, remember to multiply your data with that. And uh, it's uh, it's something that we do for historical reasons, and uh, it's not necessary anymore with binary output, but uh, it's there. So you have to work with that. I, th I think right now we're saving hundreds of uh, diagnostics uh, every every month, every yeah. year, uh, and upcoming functionality in uh, E3 and Planet 3 uh, would be uh, that you'd be able to pick and choose which diagnostic, which diagnostics you, you, you want to save. So that, that will save a lot of uh, disk space. And in, in, in a, and in addition, uh, these are monthly mean diagnostics. Uh, we have for for cases like uh, planets that they have a very fast, a very 
slow, very small orbit, like they might have like a 12 day orbit, for example, or something, okay. you can uh, so you can suppress the monthly output and then create annual output only. But I think that Tom will cover that uh, tomorrow uh, because it relates with the calendar. A month cannot have less than a number of days per per. You cannot have a month with less than a specific number of days. Is it 20? It's complicated. So we'll discuss yeah, that anyway, that, that comes up possible, tomorrow. But, but you, can, you can play with that. And also, we have a, a way to generate higher frequency output than monthly means, whatever the month means for your particular planet. And I don't think we covered that here. But uh, it is possible. You just need to create a list of the variables you need. It, 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 there is no standard output file for it. Yeah, maybe some run desk for actually. I don't this, think uh, that the templates have any. Yeah. And but, but, but anyway, I just wanted to stress that uh, to create all the like uh, create all diagnostic, like uh, say scale ACC something uh, output file all. Sometimes it's useful because you will see that what actually is created, even if you don't understand most of those, at least uh, that will give you like a start. And that's mostly, uh, especially important if you start to generating those, those some months, some monthly diagnostics, they're kind of weird. I mean, you really have to know the name of the file, uh, which, which, is, which is supposed to be produced. So it's much easier just to tell, uh, to produce all because usually you don't save that, that, that many of uh, some daily diagnostics. And then, then we'll see what, what was actually saved and uh, you can delete everything that you don't need. As a matter of fact, because for the sub daily diagnostics, you are requesting them explicitly, chances are that you need them all. So you have yeah. to do it their way. Yes. So you don't have to worry about that uh, yes. for so, the sub daily. So with sub daily, it's very useful to just, just ask, ask all. Um, there was a question of if there was a centralized place for description use of diagnostic to be looked up. And Chris did say no, but there, there is um, here, there's a couple of Google Docs for AIJ and AIJL. It's not complete. It's something that we started some time ago, but we haven't finished it all. But really, for better or worse, you have to look into the diagnostic uh, output files themselves for what you're looking for. But you can follow this rule of thumb that Kosas mentioned for the AIJ, it's atmosphere, latitude, longitude. If you want the three dimension, there's some three dimensional stuff in the AIJ, but generally the three dimensional stuff is sitting in AIJL, AIJK. And the same for the ocean. We have uh, OIJ and OIJL, or OIJL, oh, yes. yeah, right? So you get three dimensional that way. So really, you have to look through it. It will come easier with time as you've gone through it and understand which ones are the key ones for your particular research interest. Just being fair in AIJ, it's it's not three dimensional. It's just there's like a variable for 500 millibars and 400 millibars. Yes. So technically, yeah. it's it's two dimensional, dimensional. but yeah. we've yeah. just like yeah. done it for each layer. There's like different levels of <laughs> yeah. clouds. There's different mm -hmm. layers of, of specific humidity. Yeah, exactly. yeah, but but, but but one should keep in mind that the most of those were created for us. Uh, so one should be careful about like uh, how to treat uh, what uh, low level or upper level, upper level are, what so what is actually uh, it is in millibars. So if you switch like to Mars, uh, then most of those diagnostics will be just out of your atmosphere. With the, yeah, be careful about yeah. yeah. Again, as we've said from the beginning, be careful the kind of atmosphere you're you're modeling, and again, what kind of diagnostic output you expect. For example, there are, there are diagnoses for the troposphere. Your atmosphere might not have a traditional troposphere if you don't have ozone, for example. So it might mean something different in that atmosphere. So um, be careful about that mixed layer deck. That's also one of the ocean diagnostics that will differ depending upon the kind of ocean and planet you're running. But in general, if you are searching for diagnostics, unless you know you want to plot a profile, so you might want to look at AIJL, for example, most of the time you will be looking at AIJ and the simplest way to search for what it's in there is you NC dump minus H this file and then you grab the output for long name. NC dump is one of the system. utilities you created when you installed the model. Yeah. The NetCDF. NetCDF, yeah. NCO is also uh, uh, useful 
tool, if you need to extract uh, data from a NetCDF file or do some uh, arithmetic on a... Right. I mean, NC dump is part of the NCO tools. No, it's yeah, not the NC dump, NC dump is part of the NetCDF library. NCO okay. is a different utility that is using the NetCDF library. Yes, sure. Well, uh, I mean, also, I mean, the way that I got a lot of the diagnostics was it, if you pull it onto your local computer and open it with Panoply, it, yeah, yeah. it shows you all the, um, and that's an easy readable um, output to see all the diagnostics within each one of these files. Yeah, and Panoply has a find feature. So if you open the AIJ file, you can mm -hmm. use the find and look for yes. things you're looking for. And that's often very effective. Mm -hmm. That's how new users often find the diagnostics. In general, the if you are just now exploring the output for the first time, Panoply is the best way forward. Yep. Absolutely. Okay, that ends our informal tutorials for the day. Um, so now we just have an open session where you can ask any kind of questions you might have. You don't have to have any questions. There have been many questions already that we have answered. So it's really up to you all to decide if you have additional questions for the day. And if you don't, we end it. And if you want to go off and do something else, of course, you're free to do so. So do we have any other questions? If you have questions, you can put them in the chat. Um, or if you really want to speak, just raise your hand and we'll pick you. So. Yeah, it might be faster to actually speak. So raise your hand if you want. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is your opportunity now, and uh, I would strongly advise you to try to, after this tutorial is done, try to look at the model, look at the run deck, look at the, make some sample output, have questions ready for tomorrow. So, Stephen. Make sure you unmute Stephen. There you go. Yeah, thank you. Been a while since I've had one of these online things. Um, what is the file name that would be used to generate a uh, time dependent solar flux? We have no time dimension in the files. The individual okay. files are a snapshot per time. So if you want to make a time, a time series plot, you either have to combine files yourself, let's say with NCO and create the time dimension, or you need to open multiple files with your script and then create the time series yourself. Yes, I think he's asked because we talked about this in the chat uh, for in, for inputting a time varying solar forcing oh, for something input. something like a GHT file, but for solar. I don't know. Um, we don't do that's possible. I mean, it, it has to be possible in the Earth because we do it in the Earth ones for historical simulations. Because well, we solar do it cycle, with, uh, the solar cycle. Rather than nine. I don't think okay. we do. I think we yeah, did with Radon, cycles, but so. this is for, is this applicable yeah. to subreddits? Um, it is possible that there is something in GIS radiation. In the GIS radiation, I don't think in Socrates. No, uh, Radon 9 is not used in Socrates. So we don't have that ability, at least for the Socrates model. We, I've not used it for the GIS. I mean, for the GIS radiation, we certainly have the solar cycle in yeah. it, right? But that is through Radon 9, which I think is not used for Socrates. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, I don't think we have that capability. Sorry, Stephen. <laughs> I mean, that's okay. Roughly, you could roughly do it by, you know, running it at one yeah, level could. and yeah. then and then change it. and then using the restart file, changing the installation. Yeah, you can always do it that way. Yeah, that's, yeah. yeah. that might be a, a low, good way to do it. Yeah, through <laughs> low resolution way to do it. Yeah, I've set up a Python script to figure out what I want the installation to be change the initialization file, run it for a year, and then keep doing that. I was just hoping that maybe there was a, a cleaner way, but it sounds like I need to make sure I know where that file is. So, it's something thanks. we can investigate uh, with our ready to transfer person and see if it's possible to, to leverage the bread and nine file that we use on the GIST side of the house. There must be a way Socrates to do it because they also use it for Earth, right? So it must be a solved problem for them. It's well, I'm pretty sure that it's not software. It's just uh, our our infrastructure because software probably takes it as, as an input uh, yeah. parameter, but we have to provide it. We so. we can have this offline. Yeah, yeah I think we should. I'll look it. into it, Stephen. I think I know. We can even ask Eric tomorrow, right? Yeah. But you can okay. do it. You can do it for Earth, but not an exoplanet right now. I guess is the answer because for modern Earth using the GIS reader. Yeah, using GIS reader. We can tell you how to do that. 
All right. Thank you, Dr. Ray. Okay. Uh, Alan? Yes. I heard about two things um, today, uh, which I want to know whether there is any way of getting around um, um, in, in, in the computations. Number one, <clears throat> you say that uh, the computations, the longest computations uh, that you have is only about 10 for four years. Uh, and number two uh, is that <clears throat> your um, ocean land um, uh, interfaces are kind of fixed. But you know, later on, we were also hearing that the lakes um, boundaries um, can be changed um, in certain ways. Now, lakes could also be thought about uh, as uh, you know, in, in enclosed oceans. Um, <clears throat> so um, I'm wondering whether there is there are ways of getting around these restrictions that you seem to be implying, um, which would uh, allow us to um, simulate things over much longer time scales, or when um, land water uh, interfaces are changing over time. You can simulate as long as you want. It's just a question of how long you want to wait. So we have done yeah. simulations up to 10,000 years, and I have at least, and it took nine months of wall clock time to do those simulations for starters. Yeah, I, I would say that probably the fastest, uh, like the, the, the easiest uh, task that I have seen Probably it, it's still several minutes per Earth month, so it's probably about half an hour per per year. So consider like forty eight uh, Earth years per uh, twenty four hours clock time, and then uh, depends how long you want to wait uh, to get uh, to get your simulations done. So and they, and also you can change the number of digits used in the year that you are simulating. So you can put like a six digit year instead of a four digit year, and then you're gonna go up to a million years. And by year, it means orbit, right? So if you have a very fast rotator, in a, a very small orbit, then you can have like 100,000 orbits, which might result into something like a thousand years on earth. And you can still simulate that. So the, when it comes to number of years simulated, the only thing is how long you want to wait. We've done 40,000 orbits, for example, for yeah. some of the fast rotating exoplanets. Yeah. That's doable. Also, also I think maybe there's like two questions built in because it, you rarely need to run a climate simulation longer than a few thousand years. It's going to come to equilibrium. I think some people might be asking about processes that are geological, and, yes. and the, the model is not doing that anyway. So it doesn't matter if you could run the model for 10 million years that you're not getting any differences in the climatology because the model's not doing those kind of things. So it's it's a climate model, not a not a it's not doing plate tectonics or things like that. So it the climatology is going to be the same if you run it 10,000 years or 10 million years. Uh, so so you, you're not really getting anything anyway by by adding, even if you could run it longer. And that brings us to the second question you had about the lakes and the oceans. So yes, right now we cannot change the, the, the surface types dynamically. If something is land or something is ocean, then it has to stay like that or for the whole simulation or, or, or ice, land ice. Permanent but ice. Uh, yes, la, the permanent ice, not the sea ice. Um, and as for the lakes, they cannot mix with the ocean. So if you have a coastal grid box, this cannot contain a lake. If the lakes are further inland, so they will. Uh, and then if you create a combination of lakes that flood completely the grid box and you create a big lake, let's say the Caspian Sea on, uh, on present day Earth, then this is perfectly fine. The model will treat it as a lake, but the thing is that there is no heat transport across grid cells, there is no Vertical lake mixing. dynamics, no vertical, no, there's no ocean dynamics, no vertical mixing. It is just, you know, a lake that stays in its grid box and doesn't care whether there is another lake next to it or not. It's not like, it will not start behaving like an ocean. It will stay as a lake. 
practice. Oh, unfortunate. <laughs> no, it's well. It's I mean, a different tool for. Uh, but, but, I mean, there is there is as I said when I talked in the beginning, there is there has been talk for a number of years to be able to allow dynamic changes in the surface types, but it's a very difficult problem that we don't have time to go into here. It's a very technical problem, but it's something we have been working on for many years and hope to have some solutions for, but mostly to go, as I said from the beginning, say your ocean freezes at the bottom. In this case, the model would not crash, but instead it'd be turned into permanent land ice, for example. Well, that's the yeah. biggest change that we would like to happen in the model, especially for colder planets. Um, other like kinds of dynamic surface changes will probably be possible too, probably, but eventually we will have that, but we just don't have it at the moment. Think so. And and as we said, uh, as Chris was saying, I mean, this model is really for time scales on the order maximum, thousands of years. If you want to look at longer term changes, what one would do is run the model the equilibrium for a given scenario. And then you might use the output from that model to bootstrap a new model with different features, for example, it's possible. Although you have to be, although it's very difficult to change uh, topography in that manner. It's not impossible, but it's it's challenging to do that kind of work where you would use an RSF file from a run that has a different kind of bathymetry and topography in your second run. Yeah, also in terms of like uh, how long it would take, uh, keep in mind that I just uh, referred to the simplest case, but often uh, your atmosphere may be, let's say, not very stable and you have to go to much shorter time steps or you enable more expensive physics uh, like tracers or something. So uh, you may get as slow as just maybe two years for 24 hours of work time. Uh, this the most complicated uh, configuration. So uh, I guess uh, you should, you may have to be not that optimistic in terms of how many uh, years you actually can uh, simulate in some reasonable time. So that, yeah. I mean, there, there may be a case where, where you might want to use, for example, the QFOX uh, Ocean and then a fully coupled uh, run that maybe uh, less computationally expensive than a fully coupled system. Yeah, in fact, by the way, in the exoplanet community, most GCM models are using these, what we've described earlier, Qflux equals zero ocean because they're computationally cheap or their GCM doesn't have fully coupled oceans. So that's the standard in that community. We're one of the few groups that typically runs fully coupled oceans for all of our exoplanet simulations that add oceans. But just quickly back to your question about these long time scales and looking at changes in the model going forward in, in long time scales. No GCM that I'm aware of does that. Yeah. More or less all of these GCMs are built to look at climate change on short-term scales, thousands of years. Mm -hmm. Usually if you want to do deep paleo time climate, people start out with different initial conditions and run the model from there in every case. Yeah, people have done transient simulations for like 10,000 for like the deglaciation, uh, but otherwise you're do, doing snapshots, you know, do, do you know, different simulations for sort of different intervals and kind of do it that way. Uh, Igor, the, there is a question about vegetation and how... Uh, can I ask just one related question? Sure. Yeah. Um. I believe, uh, I can't recall the exact details now, I have seen a paper which is trying to simulate what the Earth's continental configurations would look like, um, you know, several tens of million years or maybe hundreds of million years later. And yes. as far as I recall, that was using a rock, a rock 3D uh, code. Yes, is that was my, that's one my problem. Uh, okay, so then how do you do it? Well, as I said, you start out with different boundary conditions at the beginning. So in that case, I was working with some people that do geodynamics models. And in those models, they make predictions for what the next supercontinent phase in Earth's history will look like. So we take their estimates for what the next supercontinent phase topography and bathymetry was, 
And then we put that in to Rocky 3D and then we run it. That's how we did it. So we start out at 250 million years in the future. We don't start out today and get to 250 million years. We start at 250 million years and model that climate at 250 million years into the future. You understand? It, it's a snapshot of the future yeah. that yeah. was generated by another model. Yes. Okay. Oh, so no answer means yes. No, he said the things in the, okay. in the chat. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. See the chat. Okay. Any other questions? Please raise your hand if you want to speak up or put it in the chat window. And it's okay if you don't. I mean, tomorrow we'll be around again. We'll have another Q&A tomorrow afternoon. If you have more questions in the meantime, you can bring them up. Bring them up then. How are we going for user-friendly bespoke total and also? Okay, I'm not, I don't think I'm not sure what's going on there. I'm, I'm probably missing part of the conversation. Uh, oh, it, it, in putting like new token yeah. files? Yeah, yeah. So again, uh, as we said, said toward the beginning, Stephen, I think generally what you want to do is see if we've already done it. Okay. So for example, why don't we, why don't I do this? Why don't I go... I can just share, hold on a minute. I'm gonna show you something that may be useful. Um, well, while Mike's doing that, there there are topo files. I mean, for, for Mars, I think there's topo files for Venus, there's topo files for Paleo Earth. So there are ones that the group has done in the past. So that probably starting from there would be best. But it, 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 I mean, if there's some other unique configuration, probably start from the topo files that we have and see how they're configured and start from there. And then try to but really the topo files are trivial. They have like a handful of variables in there. Well, and okay, then you- The OIC them, file just, is, the OIC file is not trivial. No, not the OIC, yeah. the, the topo file. Yes. Files. Yeah, but the other files are not. So this is this link that we, we sent out towards the beginning of the tutorial, or we talked about in the beginning of the tutorial, that contains um, the names of different files, or, sorry, that contains directories associated with different papers we have published over the years. And as I said, the boundary condition files, meaning the topography files, the bathymetry files, the OIC files, all of those for a given run will be in these subdirectories. That's where I would start. On top of that, we have some other things sitting in here, not well documented, I'm afraid, but let me see if I can find, yeah, here. But you're working on it, right? In the documentation. I'm, I'm working on many things, yeah. <laughs> um, this is a directory called Land, C, B, C, D, Habitable World. So this was a, a project that we were funded a ROSES project we were funded by NASA some years ago, where we created um, boundary condition files that people could use for different scenarios. So as I pointed out, uh, there's a couple in here for those deep time future ones, like Amazia F200 million years. That means 200 years, million years in the future. Aurica, 250 million years into the future. That's another set of boundary condition files. The Cretaceous, 65 million years ago. We have boundary condition files if you want to model Cretaceous. Guandana, 450 million years ago, so those are in here. Mars, Pangaea, 180 million years ago, they're in here. Venus, for using modern day Venus topography, but different kinds of possible uh, water inventories, those are in here. So for, I would say to first order, I would always start here to see if there's something we've already done in one of our former papers or in this uh, land, sea, BCD, habitable worlds. If it's not there, then yeah, reach out to us and we'll see what we can do. If it's not a lot of boundary condition files, a lot of scenarios, then probably we can help some. But I agree with Costas in general, creating a, a topography and a bathymetry file is easy. The topo and topo OC files are, are yeah. straightforward. Creating the OIC file, the ocean initial condition file can be challenging. Um, because it uses things like potential temperature and salinity, and you have to decide what kind of reasonable values to use there. And that's something we can help with. 
and, and Tony, of course, is our ocean expert, and he can also help with that. So yeah, that's, I, I was reading in the comments that we have a Fortran uh, utilities to generate uh, uh, OIC files and to OIC files. Okay, that's news to me. <laughs> <laughs> I've always done it myself. So these are Gary's. Uh, oh, they're Gary's. Yeah. yeah. Gary's but they are really easy to, to modify, uh, to suit your needs. Okay. So it's not it's not as desperate. Um, <laughs> yeah. Very cool. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you for that question. That was a very good, good question. Um, it also shows how much you guys have come in the last three years, because the last time I asked that question, I think in 2019, the answer was, yeah, just just use what we've done. Don't worry about it. So <laughs> well, it was a learning curve for us, right? Yeah. How much? Yeah. Uh, well, you've learned and I salute you. Thank you. Um, I guess Frank here is asking years ago, decades ago, Earth time models relied on tuning to make ocean atmosphere coupling match reality. Has that now been eliminated or is that a parameter that can be set? It is still a reality. No, no, no. no. There, there was a period in climate modeling where there was drifts in things. Uh, it's, it's kind well, of I'm not sure exactly what he's talking about, but we still have parameters in the model that try to get the cloud fraction right. Um, this is a different thing. That's a different thing. We're talking about the I don't know. Did that answer your question, Frank? If not, you can unmute and and say more if you like. Okay. I know it's probably either it's got to be in the middle of the night for you, Frank. He's in Australia. I'm not sure the time. Oh, right oh right. boy! Wow. Uh, That's dedication. Yeah. Four thirty a.m. Oh my god! Oh my god! <laughs> it's no point. No point in getting a good night's sleep. Maybe it's a good good morning sleep. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> is he participating tomorrow? <laughs> Are you? Well, yeah, we'll find out. Yeah. Okay. Uh, schedule. More questions? Any other questions before we sign off for the day? Were there any earlier questions from like earlier in the day that might be good to go back over? I, I wasn't keeping or that we didn't fully of, answer of for chat. people. Yeah. That's Donald Glazer, by the way, whose voice you're hearing. He's our NPP postdoc, and Donnie is also a new user of the model, so yeah, he has a lot I'm, of sympathy for you. I, I'm learning too, so. <laughs> I, I guess there was a question about OIC from Stephen. I don't know, did we? We, we addressed that. Oh. Yeah, Alec, exactly. It's also past midnight in India, absolutely. At least we're on the East Coast, not the West Coast. He works for them. Then. The OIC has become more into, I don't know if this was a planet one to planet development. It, it used to be like enthalpy and the weird stuff. Now, now you could just give it a temperature and a salinity. It just has to be consistent. In right. okay. That's a feature of that too. Yes. Okay. Well, if that's it. Then we will sign off for the day and we will catch all tomorrow starting at the same time with uh, there'll be a couple additional people showing up like Tom Clooney will talk to us a bit more about the calendaring system and uh, Geronimo Villanueva will talk a bit about how we can create observables from Rocky 3D uh, for things like JWST and, and things, things like that. Okay, thank you all, see you tomorrow.